Welcome back to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Rich, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show. It's been about probably close to eight months since you were last on. Doesn't seem like it, but it has been a while. Do you mind reintroducing yourself to everyone out there listening? Hi, uh, yeah. Thanks for having me on again. I'm always uh, glad to be here, talk to you. Um, Richard Bartholomew. If you Google Richard Bartholomew JFK, you'll see all my JFK stuff. Uh, if you Google uh, Richard Bartholomew cartoons or my brand name, Bartholomew's, you'll get both from that. So uh, that should introduce you. My bios are all over the place. Uh, but um, born and raised in Texas, born in Dallas, South Oak Cliff, not far from where Oswald was hanging out, actually two blocks from the house on Harlandale um where uh, a team of uh, operation 40 assassins were staying and left like days before the assassination um and all kinds of stuff like that um i have a substack bartholabuse.substack.com where i have this little uh a pinned article it's called my small world of jfk conspiracy it tells you all about my experience growing up and discovering as an adult that I was surrounded by the conspiracy. You know, starting with little things like the addresses that, you know, I lived at. Everywhere I lived, I lived near conspirators and witnesses and activities that, that happened. I was only 13 miles from Dealey Plaza when it happened, 12.9 to be exact. That's where my elementary school was, second grade. and. Um, I was in school. They didn't let school out. Principal came home and told us it happened. Let school out. Spent the rest of the weekend watching uh, TV. Um, and um, then grew up in Dallas in the stigma of that. And I know that that's not around now anymore. Uh, even in Dallas, you don't you don't see it unless you unless the city of Dallas is sort of like pushed on it. Things like, uh, you know, wanting to reserve the place for a big anniversary, like what happened in the 50th. Uh, and then you get a lot of pushback from the city of Dallas because they don't, they don't want to have anything to do with it. They're changing. That's why they're changing Dealey Plaza. They want to erase any chance of you going to Dealey Plaza and seeing it as it was that day. Well, as much as you can profit off it being an assassination location, much like they do every anniversary, there is also a horrible memory with that way that it looks. If you keep it the original thing, which for historical context, I would support. But for a lot of people, I mean, especially if you're the mayor of Dallas, you're like, God, dang, we're trying to brand our state to be, uh, you know, in a good way for people to come. And yeah, that might be an attraction, but it's also not a good attraction. It's like living in the Amityville house. I mean, you're kind of like, ah, I would like to at least paint it. Yeah, well, you know, uh, the biggest attraction in Texas was the Alamo, and that was a horror story. No offense, if I'm going to if I'm going to Texas, I'm going to Dealey Plaza and ain't the Alamo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, still, I mean, it's close, but more people will still go to the Alamo. That was horrible. That was like a a mass killing. Um, but they turned that around to where Texans were. Heroics. That's shifting back now to where the uh, the Alamo guys were not that heroic. And it's bizarre. There's a whole deep side to that. Uh, I want to get this book I just learned about. It's been around for a while, but it's called Forget the Alamo, uh, which tells the true story. But anyway, so they spin it to, you know, a tourist attraction. You're right. Profit. But they have the Sixth Floor Museum. And they're making a big profit off of that, and they're spinning. Oswald did it. They got the plaque over at Tenth and Patton, where it says Oswald killed Tippett, which didn't happen. Uh, you got in, in, anyway there, and we've made very little progress on pitting him down on that. Um, but Robert Grodin is still in Dealey Plaza, and. Uh, People can talk to him and get the truth. And there's people around Daily Plaza that can. Over the years that we've kind of known each other and we've done these JFK podcasts, you've slowly alluded more into the conspiratorial stuff or the more fringe ideas about the conspiracy. You think last time or the time before that, we had talked about Governor Connolly. 
Um, and we'd gotten a little bit more into Texas politics, which I think is very, very important because digging through testimonies and looking at uh, different characters involved, you can stay around the basic Alan Dulles, um, LBJ, and a lot of things. But there is the LBJ kind of connections with things. And it comes in with the big oilman theory that's out there that some people believe and some tend not to. But there are weird connections, which I do think are important. And one of these I mentioned to you that I wanted to discuss was about Harold Byrd. Um, we've kind of talked about him briefly, part of why he gets connected in there, but, um, his involvement in politics in general, uh, when it comes to Dallas and a lot of the things he was involved in, he was the owner of the sixth floor school book depository building where Oswald took a shot or allegedly took a shot. Nobody gets to the heart of this thing, like Texas oil man, David Harold Byrd. Here in Texas, we call him D. Harold Bird. I first learned about this guy before I was deeply into the Kennedy assassination. Because I went to the University of Texas, where he was a huge supporter and donor. He had gone to the University of Texas. Uh, and he made a lot of money in the oil business. And he started giving a ton of it to UT. He especially liked the football team. And he liked the band. I was in the band. And we had a nice new music building that was built with his funding. We had the biggest bass drum in the world, which was purchased with his donations. There are awards given to band members every year still called the Bird Awards for leadership. We had a nice lounge, beautiful lounge, leather chairs, oak, the whole nine yards called the bird room. We call it the bird room. It's where we went to relax in the bird room. So bird played a big role in the culture uh, of UT athletics and the band especially. And so we we were taught all about this guy, the good side, the 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 uh, the good Texas history side. Um, and, you know, he's still honored to this day at the University of Texas and in the band. But when, uh, when I got out of school and I had been working there for about eight or nine years, and I decided it was time to really dig into the assassination, uh, I came across his name pretty quickly in the context of the assassination. And I was shocked. It shocked me. Uh, you know, we weren't taught that he owned the Texas School Book Depository Building. Uh, see, they don't they don't tell you. We're taught Texas history from junior high up in Texas, and so we most Texans just without even trying know a ton about Texas history. But we know the Disney version. I call it the Disney version. And <clears throat> and when I discovered he owned the depository, I already knew enough about the assassination to know this is bad. Uh, they've been telling us a bunch of lies, and <clears throat> but he his ties to UT are well known. Um, his ties to the assassination aren't as well known, or if known at all. Um, and he was part of a really powerful group um, involved with the with UT and the CIA and JFK, and they all knew each other. They shared backgrounds and futures. They they were all anti Kennedy people. They had uh, they shared their grievances with each other about Kennedy, um, and they continued to have business and personal ties into the future, and and ties to all of them have ties to that crime, our most notorious crime. I'm talking about Johnson, Dulles. Cavill, Helms, Lansdale, Burris, Rostow, Ransom, George de Morenshield, and a guy named Colonel Delk Simpson, which you probably haven't heard of. But uh, <clears throat> I discovered his, his links to all these guys and more. And so that's basically who he is. He was born in 1900. So he was uh, 63 at the time of the assassination. Uh, made his money in the 
20s or 30s, he started out, he has the nickname Dry Hole, D.H. Bird, Dry Hole Bird, because he, he drilled like a bunch of dry holes in a row. And terrible luck when you're drilling in Texas and you can't find oil, but that's the way he started out. And he had like a string of a dozen or two dozen dry holes. And so he got that nickname. But he soon hit oil like everybody doing that does in Texas and made his fortune. And by, by really by 1931, he had made his money. And one of the first things he decides to do with that money uh, is um, fund um, his cousin's trip to the South Pole. His cousin is Admiral Richard Byrd. And Richard Byrd was a pioneer aviator and an admiral, and he explored the South Pole and the North Pole. That was his cousin. And so he gave him a bunch of money for his radio equipment, his avionics and his, and his, his radio equipment. And they set him up with a guy named Arthur Collins in Grand Rapids, Iowa. And Arthur Collins was a teenager. Arthur Collins became famous uh, early on for this thing where he, he had a ham radio. He built it himself and he was able to have contact with Admiral Byrd uh, during his trip to the South Pole. He's in Rapid City, Iowa, and he's talking to Bert. This was a big deal in the 30s. So um, that's how Arthur Collins became famous. Arthur Collins then parlayed all that into the Collins Radio Company, where he built radios. They grew up and became a huge technology company, a big uh, defense contractor. By the 50s, the Defense Department is telling all the defense, big defense contractors, the ones that they relied on, that, you know, we could be nuked any day. Russia could drop bombs on us any day. We need you guys to spread out, build other plants in other parts of the country. So uh, Bird built his uh, plant outside of Rapid City, outside of Dallas, in Richardson, Texas, just north of Dallas, suburb of Dallas. And of course, he picks Dallas because his good buddy, D. Harold Byrd, is there, the cousin of the guy that made him famous, Richard Byrd. And so um, Byrd and so Byrd, well, well, the point I'm getting at is Byrd and Collins were tight. Collins became a CIA contractor by the time of the assassination, and they're all over the Kennedy assassination uh, because their radios were in all, their avionics were in all airplanes by then, and still today. If you watch the movie Goldfinger and you see James Bond getting on the airplane that he let, soon discovers is Goldfinger's airplane. He thinks he's being taken to Washington to meet the president, but he, it turns out to be Goldfinger's airplane and he's been kidnapped. As he's getting on that plane, the stair steps, look at the logo on the antenna above the plane as he's getting on. It's the Collins radio logo. That's how big Collins Radio was, and Goldfinger came out in 1964. Now, the other thing about Bird is, <clears throat> of course, he's connected to the crime scene big time <clears throat> because he owned the building. Um, and if, if you know the conspiratorial, even if you know JFK 101, you know a lot of weird stuff happened in that building, stuff that had to be planned out. Um, this wasn't just, you know, a little conspiracy where they said, uh, you know, oh, look what happened in this building. Uh, we better start twisting things around and fixing things and covering things up. No, they planned this all out. They had contingency plans in place. Um, now, you you know the name probably Roy Truly, the superintendent of the building. And he um, he probably... I don't know this for sure. A guy named William Weston would know. And I want to get up to speed on Weston's books. You mean uh, Wally Weston? Wrote... No, there's a guy named, <clears throat> a guy named William Weston. If you look him up, you'll see his books. Whole history of the Texas School Book Depository. Who owned it and when? What happened to it? And <clears throat> I know everything I know about what happened in that building. And that's, he, he's the guy I first learned about reading his stuff in the old journals. 
uh, in the uh, late eighties is where I learned that um, Bird owned the building. And of course he only owned it until the seventies. Uh, he sold it to a guy, but the guy didn't keep it up and arson set it on fire those of us who were in Dallas and knew about that figured that the city of Dallas was trying to get rid of that building. But they managed to save it. Fire department managed to save it. And uh, the guy that, that bought it from Bird, Aubrey Mayhew, defaulted on a loan after that because he didn't want the building. Uh, they just panned it off on him, hoping that the building would become you know, a ruin and they would be able to tear it down. <laughs> and then he tried to... I'm sure he was somehow involved, uh, you know, directly or indirectly. And the arson, you know, if you don't have any security, if you're not watching the building, you know, somebody can come along and try to set it on fire. But they could have done it uh, deliberately. You can do that. And so, but since they saved the building, uh, they def he defaulted on the loan, which went back to the, uh, Republic Bank of Dallas, which is the, the Republic Bank building plays all through the assassination because <clears throat> it's where the CIA headquarters was in Dallas. And so, of course, they had the loan on the building. and But the contract was that it, the ownership divert, reverted back to Bird, and so he owned it again. And then he eventually uh, resold it in the 70s. And then Dallas County ended up with it and they turned it into the Sixth Floor Museum. But here's the thing, weird little things happen. All the things you may know about, basic JFK evidence. Uh, you may not have heard about the flooring project that was taking place two weeks before. Um, well, maybe more than that, like a month before. Were they, they just were redoing, they were, yeah, they were redoing the flooring. They were redoing the flooring. But, you know, what a better way, you know, sorry, guys, we got to like do our warehouse stuff on these other floors for a while because we're laying new floors up there on the sixth floor. So they get everybody out of there and they have their handpicked people up there, you know, supposedly laying flooring. But even if they are just laying flooring, they're also accessing the sixth floor for the weeks prior to the assassination. They're scoping it out. They're setting it up. They're getting everything ready, and by the week of the assassination, they um, they put all the boxes back up there, and everything looks normal. But the thing is, they have access. Now, if you're laying new flooring in a building, the owner set that up. The building superintendent is in charge of it. You know, he's making sure that you know he knows who's up there and what they're doing, and rescheduling everybody else and all that. That's Roy Truly, Roy Truly. And so Roy Truly, the superintendent of the building has to work for the owner of the building. And so that gets you, that's not an offhand, that's not a, like a an owner that doesn't know what's going on. Uh, I think D. Harold Bird knew what was happening in this building and was a part of it. Now, a weird thing happened right before the assassination. Uh, the electrical power to the whole building uh, went out, stopped working five minutes prior to the assassination. Uh, now, those are <clears throat> to the not only the electricity for the lights and all that, but to the phone system. They stopped working five minutes before the assassination. Those are two entirely different electrical systems. And, you know, that, that's very weird when that happens. Um, so you have to assume here that there was intentional interruption, which, which you know, electricians can do. Uh, and that's been in dispute for a long time. People like to argue about that, about whether it really happened. But according to William Weston, it happened and... Um, you know, you have to plan something like that. You have to know where the fuse boxes are. You have to know, you know, you have to count down to the switch off. You have to count down to the switch back on. And to do it with the phone system, you know, takes a lot of preparation. So 
that happened. And well, without diving into too much, bill- without diving into too much speculation about the bidding, we're kind of going off track here a little bit about Harold Bird, which was the initial thing. But um, what about Harold Bird? About say, there's still. What, what do you mean we're done with that part? He took the six four window and put it in his house and hadn't separated like a trophy. You didn't mention that, right? Sure, that's the one that's always mentioned. But the using of the building as the crime scene and setting it up as the coverage crime scene, that's the direct conspirator aspect. A, uh, a building owner, where something famous happens in his building, and he wants a souvenir of it, and He's an eccentric millionaire or billionaire. You know, that's not as bad. But stuff happening in his building directly related to the plot makes him a plotter because he's approving all of this activity. Again, Um, but you would need to know like more factual base to be able to prove some of that stuff. I mean, a lot of this stuff, we talk about the building and just weird connections. They're weird, sure, but doesn't that lead into like speculation? Isn't that kind of a little bit... Like there's more stuff like him getting a government contract after Kennedy's killed would be more weight to um, the argument of why people would point at him. I mean, there's a lot of things that are involved with Johnson that would have him a little bit more weight. We're going to get to that. So the other thing you got to here's here's the rundown of what you got to know about Bird. So that's the basic stuff. That's the building. Uh, you got to know about Johnson and Connolly, his relationship to them. You got to know about a lady named Barbara Jester Burris, Barbara J. Burris. Uh, went by Barbara J. Uh, that's going to ring a bell to people that know about the Bay of Pigs. But you got to know about her and her father, Governor Buford Jester. You got to know about the oil business, his connection to that, and the oil business connected to the assassination. We're going to go, I can go to the Civil Air Patrol. You got to know about that. You got to know about his hunting trips. And when you get into his investments, directly related to a hunting trip that he took. Then you got to know about Mac Wallace. Yeah. You know, we suspect Mac Wallace was there in the building. All that's got to be planned. That's his building. Uh, he had uh, connections to Mac Wallace. Uh, Collins Radio, we already did a little bit of that. Um, and University of Texas. So you got to know about those few things. So let's go into Johnson and Connolly. So, um, you know, LBJ, he had conspiracy theories. He didn't think Oswald acted alone. He told Walter Cronkite he didn't think Oswald acted alone. But his conspirators were like the commies and Castro and uh, Vietnamese assassins uh, getting revenge for you know, DM and the murder Inc. in the Caribbean, which includes a lot of things, the CIA mafia plots against Castro. That was LBJ. He always went to those. He never mentioned his best buddies, one of which was D. Harold Byrd. And Byrd's other cousin, Senator um, Senator uh, Byrd of Virginia, um, and there's a picture out there, I've seen it, uh, just a press photo, where Johnson is meeting uh, Senator Byrd in, uh, in Washington at this one point, and, and <laughs> Senator Byrd is in a car. And LBJ is leaning over and kissing his hand. That's the esteem that LBJ held for for Senator Byrd. He was very powerful, sure. You you know, everybody was either with him or against him. He was a very powerful senator. But that was Byrd's other cousin. That was D. Harold Byrd's other cousin. Uh, D. Harold Byrd financed LBJ and Connolly in their political campaigns. So you, so they're close. The point is, um, one of his closest allies. And Bird is in the Del Charo set, you know, the Hotel Del Charo in California, where they had the racetrack, and, and J. Edgar Hoover is taking all his buddies out there. You know, Bird is in the Del Charo set. That's Clint Murkison. Bedford Wynn, D.H. Byrd, Gordon McClendon, the whole oil clique in Dallas, uh, they go to the Del Charo and gamble and play the horses and have all kinds of fun. Um, And so Byrd was in with those guys. Now, Johnson's military aide, Colonel Howard Burris, was part of a treasonous back channel 
uh, during the administration. They were feeding Kennedy false information about Vietnam. And Colonel Howard Byrd was a military aide to Johnson. So uh, Burris, Howard Burris was getting information from Vietnam that was true. And he was funneling it to LBJ. So LBJ was getting all the true stuff about what was happening in Vietnam. Kennedy was getting false information. This was discovered by John Newman. And it's in his books about JFK in Vietnam and all that. Uh, but it was a treasonous back channel to Johnson. And so that's Colonel Howard Burris. Uh, Burris was close in with uh, Edward Lansdale. And you know, if you've seen the movie JFK, you know that Lansdale is is the major that Mr. X is talking about that's setting all this up and sending Fletcher Prouty to the South Pole uh, right before the assassination, getting him out of the way. Lansdale is a big planner in all this. And so, uh, and Lansdale in 63, he's visiting all the special forces bases around the country and outside the country. Uh, so there's something happening. While well, Dulles is going to strange places, so is Lansdale. And in, a, with the, in with Lansdale is this guy, Delk Simpson, another colonel who's really tight with Burris. They're like really close buddies. And they're all buddies with Walt Rostow, who's another behind the scenes longtime plotter that Kennedy didn't like and he didn't like Kennedy. Uh, and Charles P. Cabell is in with this, with this Howard Burris and back channel stuff. And Lansdale and Cabell are very close. Uh, and Rostow was Lansdale's biggest sponsor and biggest patron in the White House. Now, Byrd had close relationships with both Johnson and John Connolly. So there's the two guys that are in the motorcade. And Connolly gets shot. And he's a good buddy of Byrd as well. So Byrd is connected totally with the crime scene, any way you look at it. Um, now, so he wasn't satisfied with having a powerful a uh, U.S. senator, uh, and he wrote in his autobiography, he has this autobiography called I'm an Endangered Species, an amazing book, where, you know, these guys were so cocky. They knew they'd gotten, gotten away with the assassination. Uh, he actually revealed all this stuff. In it, uh, tons of, I learned tons of stuff from his own autobiography. So it's, it's his words. And here's what he said um, about knowing powerful people. He said, another goal was to reach a rapport with politicians who ran things, especially at the seat of state government in Austin. Sam Rayburn, Rayburn Maury Shepard, John Connolly, and Lyndon Johnson on the national scene were to become men I could go to any time that I wanted action. And so were, and so were a succession of Texas governors. Um, among the ablest, he said, was John Connolly, um, who he says is in my debt for pleading his cause with Ida Nell Nellie Brill, sweetheart of the University of Texas in 1940. So D.H. Byrd introduced John Connolly to his wife, Nellie. Ida Nell Brill was her name. She was named Sweetheart of the University of Texas in 1940. And Byrd introduced Connolly to her, and he was forever grateful to him for that. So that's how tight Byrd is with the most powerful politicians in the country by this time. Uh, and his cousin Harry Byrd, the Senator Harry Byrd of Virginia, uh, you know, Johnson's kissing the guy's hand in that photo. All right, now I mentioned Howard Burris. So Howard Burris is his wife plays into this too, because she is Barbara Jester. You know, he said that he knew a whole string of governors. He tried to get in tight with, you know, if you're big oil and you have lots of money in Texas, you want to give it to the right people, you find which governors are on your side and you, you finance them. And so Governor Jester, Governor Jester, Buford Jester was one of them. His daughter was Barbara Jester. She married Howard Burris. So she became Barbara Jester Burris. And so she became tight with Byrd. They met when, you know, Byrd 
uh, millionaires like that in Texas, they want to find cultural things to put their money into, you know, to make them look good. And around this time, there was a guy named Van Clyburn, this kid who was in the, um, there was a world piano competition. And any competition that we could get into that was international that involved the Russians, we wanted to beat the Russians. And so that's what Van Clyburn did. Not only the first American to win this international piano concert piano competition, he beat the Russians doing it. So he was the darling of all the anti-communists. Barbara Burris was a big supporter of his, and Harold Byrd met Barbara Burris when he decided to support Van Cliburn. So uh, I'll give you another tidbit about Van Cliburn later um, that ties in more to the conspiracy. Um, now, so, so they were mutual supporters of Van Cliburn, uh, you know, Bird said in his autobiography, I wanted to be welcome, a welcome member of Dallas society. Uh, I was an early booster and close friend of pianist Van Cliburn and Jose Aturbi. Barbara J. is the wife of Air Force Intelligence Colonel Howard L. Burris, Vice President Johnson's military representative. And she was the daughter of Buford Jester. Right. So um, now. Bird was on the board of directors of uh, Jack Austin Crichton's uh, oil business, Dorchester Gas Producing. He was on lots of, of boards of directors, but Crichton was also uh, a play, one of these players. And we don't have to get into all the details of Crichton, but you'll find his name all over the place. Um, now, you're aware that there was a party in February of 63, right? Where the Morin Schilt is there, Ruth Payne is there, Michael Payne is there, and the Oswalds are there, and a bunch of other people, strange people. Mostly uh, a group from, you know, actually Michael Payne was living there. Nobody ever mentions that, but I keep reminding myself of that. Michael Payne was rooming with these Magnolia Oil Company guys in this house where they held that party. And that's where... You know, up until this time, DeMorean Show is, is with Oswald almost constantly, getting him, trying to get him jobs, getting him jobs, you know, uh, driving him around town and, and to events and things. And it's like, he's, he's, he's known as Oswald's closest friend. But until that party, when after that party, Marina moves in, Later in April, Marina moves in with Ruth Payne. That's when they first meet Ruth Payne. So you know that's a big deal, that party. So the other guys from um, from Magnolia Oil, a guy named Schmidt, a guy named Pierce, a guy named Fredrickson, uh, they were taking scientific Russian classes at Magnolia Oil from a guy named Ilya Mamontov. Well, after the assassination, <clears throat> Mamontov became Marina's interpreter. When they hustled Marina out of Dallas over to Arlington into a hotel where they could uh, talk to her and get the story straight with her. And so Ma this guy, Russian speaking guy named Mamontov, was her interpreter. And that was arranged by Jack Austin Crichton, the guy whose board of directors D.H. Bird is sitting on. Now, <clears throat> according, to, uh, according to Peter Dell Scott, Christian was Army Reserve Intelligence Service. Uh, and he was an apparent outsider, but he arranged for Marina to have this excessive right winger, Mamontov, as her interpreter. So, you know, that's the connection to the party where Ruth Payne, uh, Ruth Payne met the Oswalds. And, you know, now, um, oh, oh, let me back up real quick. Barbara J, that's going to ring a bell with people who are in on the Bay of Pigs. There was one of the troop ships that took troops to the Bay of Pigs was called the Barbara J. Um, and uh, people have speculated, oh, that must have been uh, Barbara Bush. Well, nobody's ever been able to put a J with Barbara Bush. I think it's Barbara Jester. And it's because of this connection with D.H. Bird 
And he's funding all of this. He's got to be funding. Of course, he's funding CIA. He's funding politics. He's funding Collins, which is a CIA contractor. He's funding CIA. So they cryptically named that troop ship after his good buddy, Barbara J. Burris, you know, wife of Howard Burris, the treasonous intelligence guy who's a military aide to Johnson. Now, <clears throat> further with oil, you know, Byrd is a member of the Dallas Petroleum Club. Uh, now, anybody who's in oil and lives in Dallas or even not living in Dallas, you you become a member of the Dallas Petroleum Club. My father-in-law was a um, geologist, and he worked in the oil business, and he was a member of the Dallas Petroleum Club. Other people that you might know, you know, ring a bell, that were members of that club were George de uh and George Bush. Uh, so anybody who was anybody in oil in Texas and in Dallas were a member of that club. And so they all knew each other from that club. So that's where D.H. Byrd could have known de Morenshield. And of course he knew de Morenshield. De Morenshield got his degree in petroleum engineering from the University of Texas. So they had that in common too. Uh, and while he was there at the University of Texas, de Morenshield was investigated by the FBI and the Office of Naval Intelligence. And, you know, he's been, he, he been working in intelligence since he got to the United States. And that's the Morin Shield. So Bird probably knew the Morin Shield. Um, now, um, before you move on here, let's just get something out front here. When it comes to the importance of big oil in politics, you might have to describe the influence and power of big oil in politics and why some of these names get brought up. Specifically, I'd like to focus more on some names like Harold Byrd, um, Clint Murchison Sr., um, H.L. Hunt, only because doing clips for them for YouTube, I came across a little bit of things that I would consider influencing Johnson's political career as being a conspiracy theory. But H.L. Hunt is the prime example for me on this, which is that he stated it in an interview and it's quoted in a magazine in 64. And he actually makes some statements about Kennedy in it as well, too. Um, he quoted to a magazine saying the only reason that he went to the 1960 Democratic um, Convention in Los Angeles was to get Johnson nominated. Now, in 64, when he was interviewed, he admitted that he had gone sour on Johnson. Um, but he believed that only because in 1960, Johnson had more of a conservative attitude, which he was all for. Kennedy, he was afraid that he was going to go as far right as his dad would allow him or make him. Um, and that's what he stated in the interview. Then he also states later that he would you know, Johnson was never going to go for the vice president spot. It was only H.L. Hunt that was trying to nudge him towards it. So there's already evidence right there, him stating it himself that he was influential into Johnson's political career. I mean, I'm pretty sure everyone kind of is aware that Clint Murchison Sr. also as well, too, um, was a prime uh, supporter of Lyndon Johnson because they'd have a friend in the White House. But I, you have to explain the big politics. And again, you're mentioning names that I know, but a lot of people who haven't ever bothered to even look into any of this are just going to be like what the heck so if i'm guiding you here it's because i'm trying to hit major points we don't need to necessarily go into super specific details of names that you know are just weird connections yeah yeah i'm not going to go into uh, a lot of these names but these are just the names i came across now right now we're beyond the conspiracy uh we don't need to prove the conspiracy you got to keep reminding yourself of that Conspiracy is done. It's a fact. Uh, what we're now doing is uh, we're playing with the jigsaw puzzle. We're trying to figure out where the connections are. When you, when you investigate a conspiracy, uh, you're completely lost when you're dealing with motive. A lot of people are lost in the whole motive thing because you don't need a motive when you're bringing a conspiracy trial to trial. Uh, motive has nothing to do with it because it has multiple motives. You have multiple conspirators and they all have their own motives. So motive is, does not need to be established legally in a conspiracy trial. It's disregarded. Uh, and that's why the people who want to keep this hidden, they keep pushing you on motive. Uh, and what you got to do is find connections. 
And so the jigsaw puzzle here is to piece together who knew who and did they have interest in the exact, the crucial things like, like Dallas and the depository and the crime scene and Oswald and Damore and Schilt and the Paynes. Were they involved with the crime scene and the known conspirators? And so you start piecing those together. We're getting out beyond Ruby and Oswald, and you have to start putting those jigsaw puzzle pieces in place. Now, none of that is about establishing a conspiracy. That's just investigating the conspiracy that you already know exists. Now, um, you know, it's, you know, and, and that gets a little past what you really need to know. So if you don't want to, you know, get into the weeds here like this, then stick to the single bullet theory and Oswald's movements and and Ruby's movements and the killing of Tippett and all that. Uh, but we're way beyond that. Now, that's one-on-one stuff. And we're in like junior, senior level uh conspiracy stuff now uh but that's what we those of us who just who realized that there was a conspiracy at the beginning it only it only took me like reading 10 books before it was a solid it was like it's a done it's done that was before jfk came out but jfk convinced a lot of people that it was a conspiracy so very quickly you decide yeah it's a conspiracy what else can i learn about it and you start piecing together those outer pieces of the puzzle and that's what we're talking about now. So, you know, none of this is going to prove the conspiracy because we don't need to prove the conspiracy. What we need to do is see how D.H. Byrd was involved with that conspiracy. Um, and so big oil. <clears throat> All you got to do is read this. It's, you know, you can do uh, multidisciplinary stuff here. You don't have to read about the assassination. Read. Um, this major book on a whole oil business called The Prize. And that book alone will tell you about how the Rockefellers got into oil early on. And if you know anything about the Rockefellers, you know that right from the beginning, uh, John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil and politics were all hand in hand. And it continued beyond that. Everybody else that got into oil after Rockefeller they also got into politics because you've got tons of money. And so what do you do with, you, you learn from the movie uh, Ocean's Eleven that one of the things you do with money is you buy politicians. And so they were smart enough to do that. So big oil and big politics were hand in hand from the beginning because of the Rockefellers and the money, just the fact that the money is there. And politicians like money and need money and the oil guys want power and they've got money and they buy the power. And that's what D.H. Bird did. Um, and they even got involved with a, a Mexican oil company called Pantapec Oil. And that was owned by the parents of William F. Buckley Jr. You might recall that Buckley, you know, he was the guy that had a TV show um, in the 60s through the 70s. And 80s, I think, <clears throat> uh, called um, uh, oh, I can't believe I'm forgetting the name of his show, but uh, it was a, it was just an online, it was it was just a TV t talk show about politics, and William F. Buckley was the conservative voice uh, for decades, and he was uh, the founder of the National Review. Um, and he came up through Yale. He, uh, he was recruited into the CIA and he was partnered with H.L. Hunt. So right before the, you know, a decade before the assassination, William F. Buckley Jr. is in Mexico City setting up the CIA station in Mexico City, which became a big deal at the time of the assassination. So that's William F. Buckley Jr. Um, and and he was involved with Panapec Oil because, because uh, his dad owned Panapec Oil. And so Buckley is in the oil business. And um, 
when Castro uh, took over, uh, a, an oil company called Cuban Venezuela Oil Trust, which De Morenshill was involved with, uh, <clears throat> was uh, lost to the owners because uh, Castro nationalized all the local oil companies. Um, and uh, another guy that worked at Panapec Oil in Mexico was Jack Crichton, the guy we were just talking about. So he's Army Intelligence, and he's involved with this uh, William F. Buckley's dad's oil company in Mexico. And so they're all in cahoots inside the oil business. And <laughs> George de Morenshield. So, you know, they're in the oil business, and they're connected with major politics, and they're connected with the assassination. Um, and de Morenshield, uh, had established by 57, Dwarshield had established himself in oil ventures ranging from wildcat drilling, like D.H. Bird had, and aerial surveillance. And he had begun working for the CIA by 1957. Um, now, uh, I mentioned that Michael Payne was a resident. This comes from Gayton Fonzie's book, The Last Investigation. Michael Payne was a resident at Everett Glover's house, where they had that party. Uh, at the time, I call it the Strange Magnolia Party because most of the roommates there uh, worked at Magnolia Oil. Once again, oil, <laughs> the, the guys at the at the Magnolia Oil, uh, which is a major oil company in Dallas. Um, of the four housemates, um, and those four were Schmidt, Pierce, Glover, and Payne. Only Payne did not work at Magnolia Labs, uh, but Ruth Payne did know Mamontov, who did work at Magnolia, and Mamontov was the guy teaching him Russian, because Ruth Payne was teaching Russian to kids at St. Mark's, uh, you know, tutoring them. And um, so she knew, and she was a friend of Mamontov, you know. And um, all right, so. Four days prior to Oswald beginning his job at Jagger, Charles Stovall, the photography company he, that was arranged by De Morenschild, um, De Morenschild attended this party, and here's where an, one of these circles happens. According to Marguerite, Lee Oswald's mother, De Morenschild attended the party after having just left the Van Cliburn piano competition and of course, Van Cliburn was, you know, friends and supporters. One of his friends and supporters was Barbara J. Burris and D.H. Bird. So there's a big circle there. The idea that De Morenschild had attended this Van, Van Cliburn piano. No, De Morenschild is a cultured guy, sure. No big deal that he's at a piano con concert by Van Cliburn. But imagine this he was also a conspirator. There's a lot of backroom stuff happening. And we know about the Texas theater where Oswald was probably told to go there and meet up with somebody who would have the other half of a half of a torn ticket that he had in his pocket. Uh, and that's how spies met up with each other that didn't know each other previously. They, they tell you, go to this, go to this theater and sit in, they either tell you which seat to sit in or they tell you to, you know, find a guy in this area. And he'll have the other half of this ticket. That's how spy, that's basic spy business. Well, imagine what you could do at a piano. If you're high class, if you're big time society, you don't want to be going to some little dive like the Texas theater. You're going to piano competitions. You're going to piano recitals. You're going to symphonies. You're going to uh, theater productions. But you're still in a theater and there are seats and you can meet up with other spies in theaters. I think that's why De Morenschild had just come. And that's, I think they used Van Cliburn's concerts for that purpose. So it all fits. And so there you've got De Morenschild and Barbara Burris and D.H. Bird. Um, Bird probably knew David Ferry as well because I'm going to need some water for this part. Yeah, the meat cotton mouth. Bird, yeah, I usually don't talk this much. Uh, these. Bird, oh, but, uh, 
we can get through this pretty quickly. I know you got other things you got to get to. No, man, you got plenty of time, dude. We got another hour and a half if you want. Okay, cool. We won't take that long. Um, Bird probably knew David Ferry. Uh, I don't think that's been nailed down, but a lot's happened in research that I'm not up to speed on. I hope uh, we can nail that down if it hasn't been already. Uh, but D.H. Bird founded the Civil Air Patrol. He co-founded it. Um, David Ferry, as you know, was in the uh, uh, Civil Air Patrol in Louisiana. And so was Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, in fact, David Ferry was Lee Harvey Oswald's trainer in the Civil Air Patrol. Now, the Civil Air Patrol was a citizen a, a, a citizen group of pilots. You get your pilot's license, um, you get your airtime, and you join the Civil Air Patrol. And you can also like join it in advance and learn how to fly in the Civil Air Patrol. That's what Oswald was doing. Uh, they, uh, David Ferry was already an airline pi uh, pilot by then. I think American Airlines is what he worked for. Uh, he had some trouble with them. He got fired and stuff. But uh, you know, he was an airline pilot. And uh, he, was a, he was a trainer. Now, of course, they knew the history of the Civil Air Patrol. And this was a national organization. It wasn't just Louisiana. It's, it was everywhere where you had major and minor airports. And the Civil Air Patrol mostly, to this day, works out of smaller executive airports. Uh, there's one just a few miles from me. And there's probably one a few miles from anybody. There was one I grew up in Garland, Texas. There was, there was, there wasn't one in Garland, Texas, but right outside of Garland, to the south, there was one um, that was gone by the time I was growing up there. But it was a major one. But there was a landing strip at a place called Temco Incorporated. Guess who owned Temco Incorporated? D. H. Bird, and they had a defense plant in Garland which had it the only airstrip in Garland. The House Select Committee later uh, was, there's documents on this. The House Select Committee investigators were looking into a flight plan that David Ferry had filed from uh, New Orleans to Garland. And the only place he could have landed in Garland was at Temco Inc., the, the plant with the airstrip. So that's David. that's another David Ferry D.H. Bird thing, and that was happening in April of 63, David Ferry's flight uh, that the HSCA investigated. Uh, that was dropped, by the way. They, ne that never, they never got to investigate that fully. The Gaten Fonzie and those guys, they wanted to, but they were shut down on a lot of things like that. Um, so Bird was co-founder of the Civil Air Patrol. Uh, he displayed in his office, his office was 1110 Tower Petroleum Building in Dallas. Uh, he had pictures of himself in uniform with aviation dignitaries and Air Force generals. Uh, Byrd was an aviation buff, uh, and uh, uh, he, uh, he couldn't become a fighter pilot. He wanted to become a fighter pilot, but he couldn't because his eyesight was bad. He co-founded Civil Air Patrol six days before Pearl Harbor. So they needed, from the very beginning, Civil Air Patrol was there to support the military. And it was founded six days before Pearl Harbor. After World War II, he spearheaded the establishment of the cadet program that Oswald became head of uh, and gave scholarships to the cadets. I don't know if Oswald got one, but there's another Oswald D.H. Byrd connection. Oswald was a cadet in the Civil Air Patrol. and and Bird was the guy who created the cadet program. Um, so, uh, and May 24, 63, this is 63 again, May, U.S. Air Force presents Bird with its scroll of appreciation. Yeah, and you can read the text of that in his autobiography. So he was a big deal with the Air Force and the military and Civil Air Patrol and more connections with Oswald. Um, now, hunting trips. Bird liked to go hunting, big game hunting, safaris. A buddy of his that he went on these safaris with 
was a famous aviator, General Jimmy Doolittle. I don't know if you're familiar with the Flying Tigers, but that's Jimmy Doolittle. You can watch the John Wayne movie and learn all about the Flying I'm Tigers. I'm guessing it's part of that the Doolittle Report. And he went on, do a little, became a big deal because he was the, you know, he was the guy that ran the Tokyo uh, bombing raids. That's what the Flying Tigers did. Before we got into World War II, they were already doing bombing runs on Tokyo. And that's what the movie Flying Tigers is about. Um, but yeah, so he went on to become a big deal in politics. And he was a general, so he was a big deal in military and in politics. And uh, they commissioned him to do all kinds of stuff, like the Doolittle Report. Now, Burr and Doolittle were hunting buddies. Doolittle wrote this. Having, oh, no, Bird wrote this about Doolittle. Having a fondness for being number one in all my undertakings, it doesn't come naturally for me to confess that Doolittle is the one man whom I would gladly serve in any venture as number two. So huge esteem between those two guys. Um, but now, one intriguing trip that Bird made without his hunting buddy Doolittle uh, was when he went hunting in Central Africa in November and December 63. It was his first trip of five that he would eventually take outside the U.S. to go hunting. Outside the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. Outside of this continent. That was his first. November, December, 63. Bird prepared well for that trip. Temco, Inc. that I mentioned was the defense contractor in Garland that he owned. Uh, he founded it. And uh, he later merged it with his friend, James Ling's electronics company, Ling, and with uh, aircraft manufacturer Chance Vought Corporation, and it became Ling Temco Vought, LTV. Bird became a director of LTV. And that was 1961. Um, now, He became a director of LTV, and along with Ling, Bird and Ling, uh, they bought 132,000 shares of LTV in November of 63, before the assassination. They buy 132,000 shares of LTV. Um, and then Bird goes off on his two-month safari, and he returns in January to find his good friend, Lyndon Johnson, president of the United States, is building famous and a large defense contract awarded to LTV to build fighter planes to be paid for out of the 1965 budget, which had not even been approved by Congress yet. Of course, you know, and so, you know, you think a lot of things are up in the air, but all this happened and they knew it was going to happen. That's, that's foreknowledge of the assassination right there. So you wanted to hear about the investments, you know, the same kind of stuff that happened with 9-11 when you had all of that strangers going on in the stock market there. It's what they do. And those were guys who did it with the Kennedy assassination. Um, so now Mac Wallace uh, received a five-year sentence for killing John Douglas Kinzer in Austin uh, October 22nd, 51. Uh, Mac Wallace, who got off on that, by the way, he went to work for Temco Inc. of Garland, Texas, five months after that trial in 51. So there's Mac Wallace at D.H. Bird's company in Garland. Well, maybe not the Garland plant, but it's a major part of the company is in Garland. Uh, they also had a plant in California. Um, now, Wallace remained in that position until February 61, uh, four months before Henry Marshall's death, which Mac Wallace is suspected of being the murderer of Henry Mar uh, Marshall, um, who was uh, about to discover all of the crimes 
that Billy Saul Estes and Johnson were in together on. Didn't his autopsy uh, of his death get changed over? It was initially ruled as a suicide, and then it was changed later to a homicide? It's known as the famous five-shot suicide. Shot himself with a long barrel rifle <laughs> five times. So, yeah. And they had a uh, Billy Saul Estes uh, went before a grand jury in 1985 in Texas. And you'll find tons about that because it's all on the legal record. And Billy Saul Estes said, yeah, Johnson and his buddies had Henry Marshall. Henry Marshall was an agriculture department agent who had discovered a, a scam on the part of Billy Saul Estes over uh, cotton. No, over... Uh, it's cotton. It, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's cotton allotments. Yeah. So, but there was also a scam going on with, with ammonium, anhydrous ammonium tanks. And so Billy saw this was into a lot of scams. And Marshall was discovering these. And four months before Henry Marshall's mysterious death, June 3rd, 61, was when, was when uh, Mac Wallace transferred to Anaheim, California, and their LTV office. Uh, that transfer required a Navy background check. He had to get security clearance. So uh, this is like a decade after he kills a guy and gets off for it. And he passes and gets security clearance. Uh, now, how does a convicted murderer, how is he able to get a job with a defense contractor? Better yet, how is he able to get security clearance? Uh, Clinton Peoples, who was a Texas Ranger captain, investigated. He's the guy who investigated the Marshall and Kinzer murders. Uh, he reported that when the original security clearance was granted, he asked the naval, uh, naval intelligence officer handling the case how such a person could get clearance. Uh, and Politics. The answer was politics. When people, when Peoples, Captain Peoples asked, who would have had that much power? Um, the simple answer was the vice president, who at the time was Lyndon Johnson. Uh, years later, after the story broke, Billy Saul Estes in March 1984, it was eight, 1984 was the testimony before the grand jury. Um, Estes implicated um, Johnson and Wallace and Clinton Carter in the death of Henry Marshall. Um, that investigator could not recall the conversation Peoples uh, with Peoples, but he said he did say uh, no one forced him to write a favorable report. But he knew the vice president was involved, so you know what else do you need to know? He, um, he also added that he wasn't the one that made the decision to grant the clearance. You know, it didn't influence him, but he didn't make the decision. Uh, the whole matter might have been solved with a peek at the original report, but unfortunately, when the father checked, that report was suspiciously missing. It's never been seen since. All right. So we already talked about Collins Radio. Um, it was Byrd, along with John D. Rockefeller Jr., that financed Admiral Byrd's polar expeditions. Um, and uh, some of that money went for the purchase of Arthur Collins radio equipment. It was a 1933 expedition. First big break for the young Collins radio company of Cedar Rapids in May 51, did their expansion and ended up in Richardson, Texas. But also, they had a hangar at Red Bird Airport. And as we know, witnesses saw strange uh, activities right after the assassination of people rushing to get on a, a, a private airplane. Once again, Civil Air Patrol, get on a private airplane and quickly take off. Uh, that happened at, at Redbird Airport. And Collins had, had a place, had a hangar there where they would check and install avionics because that's the business they were in. Uh, so that's Collins Radio, the University of Texas. Now, let's bring up another name here, James R. Doherty. 
was a rancher down in South Texas in Beeville. You know, the Bushes ended up doing quail like quail. Bush and Cheney, those guys, they did a lot of quail hunting. Once again, hunting, quail hunting. In Dick Beeville, Cheney shot a man Texas. in the face hunting quail. On a ranch in Beeville. It wasn't the Doherty's ranch, but it was a neighbor of theirs. And that's a whole nother. You could do a whole episode on, on that. Oh, my God. I don't know about um, you, but I, quail are like a feet tall. So I'd be, yeah, uh, you yeah. have to kick but, that thing know, in the air. It's like, it's like skeet, skeet shooting. Yeah. You know, skeet shooting is just practice for quail hunting. Um, yeah. So shooting a guy in the face is hard to do when you're, when you're quail hunting. Um, uh, anyway, so. But not for lack of trying. Do Doherty. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. It's hilarious. Um, Doherty, I'll bring up Doherty because he was, I forgot to mention that when, when D.H. Bird was at UT in the, you know, 30, 20s, they had this men's dormitory, upperclassmen men's dormitory called Old B Hall, legendary. Uh, if you know anything about U University of Texas history, you know the legend of Old B Hall. That's where if you wanted to become rich and powerful, if you, it's not, you know, they say it's not what you know, it's who you know. Um, especially back in those days, you went to college, you didn't go to college to get trained for anything like they do, like they pretend to do now. Still today, the people in the know go to college to build lifetime friendships, to meet people, to meet power, power sons and daughters of powerful people so that they can move up in the ranks that way socially. Uh, now, that's where, that's where Old B. Hall comes in, because that's where anybody who was anybody ended up at Old B. Hall. And that's where D.H. Byrd was. Um, that's where William F. Buckley Sr., Jr.'s dad, the guy who owned the Panapec Oil Company, William F. Buckley Sr. Uh, was a resident at Old B. Hall, a guy named uh, Red. Rex G. and Heinz Baker, top executives at Humble Oil. Senator Richard Kleberg, who was the sponsor of uh, LBJ, LBJ's former boss at the, at the Capitol, uh, was a resident of uh, Old B. Hall. Um, William Bates, founder of the law firm Fulbright and Jaworski, Old B. Hall. D.H. Bird was there, and a guy named C.B. Smith, which is involved in my Rambler research. So, you know, these are major players that in oil, in the assassination, they're all at Old B Hall in the early days. Uh, and even if you weren't there at the same time, and I found out that um, that uh, Bird and Smith did overlap a year there. Even if you weren't there at the same time, you know, you meet somebody and you find that they were at Old B Hall. It's like having a fraternity right off the bat. Um, but here's the other thing about Doherty, the little rancher down in Beeville. He's the guy that brought Madame No Din Nu to Dallas in October 63 to be honored at General Walker's U.S. Day rally attended by Lee Harvey Oswald. Walker's aide, Robert Surrey, author of the infamous Wanted for Treason post, um, so um, that's a big deal. A lot of people don't talk about that rally where Madame No spoke, where Lee Harvey Oswald attended, but it's a big deal. And and Ed Tatro has done a lot of, he, re, he recently wrote a a big article about that. Um, now, Bird was able to give Arthur Collins his big break in 1933 because he had made his fortune by 1931. Now, here's something else Bird said in his autobiography. When he mapped out his goals with all his money, he said, high on my list was the University of Texas. Despite my enforced dropout after two years, I have nursed an abiding affection for the 40 acres. That's the nickname for the University of Texas, the 40 acres, and its fortunes, especially on the football field. 
So Bird uh, was known on campus. He donated large sums of money to the university and its Longhorn Band. Uh, and he his money went to purchase Big Bertha. That's what they called the world's biggest bass drum. Uh, and uh, the construction of the Music Building East, which is where I hung out when I was at UT, where we had the band rehearsals. And um, I mentioned the lounge there called the Bird Room. And so, and the Harold Bird Awards. Now, uh, through his patronage of the University of Texas, we're almost done here, as well as through their mutual political and Air Force friends and mutual contacts at De Gaulier and McNaughton, which is another oil related firm, Bird knew a guy named Harry Hunt Ransom. Ransom uh, was the University of Texas. He was the chancellor. He became the chancellor of the University of Texas. Uh, and he still, even though he's long dead, Harry Ransom, they have the Harry Ransom Center, which is known worldwide as one of the great libraries and collections in the world. And Harry Ransom is a big deal. He was chancellor of UT during this heyday. And um, so through, it's through Harry Ransom that D.H. Bird would have known my guy, C.B. Smith, because they became founding members in 1965 of UT's Chancellor's Council created by Harry Ransom. So they're all thick as thieves. This is a whole big rat's nest there. And just as an aside, while I was researching all this again, I was reminded that a guy, a researcher named Dave Reinmuth, had contacted me back in the 90s. He had read my Rambler article and what I'd written about Ransom and Bird, and he wanted to tell me that his maternal grandmother was a bird, was a member of the Bird family. He wanted to tell me that his maternal paternal grandfather named Reinmuth was in the OSS and he was good buddies with Harry Ransom because they sat at a desk across from each other at the OSS. So Harry Hunt Ransom was a big spy. He was OSS. And we knew that already because he brought the CIA in as recruiters at the University of Texas. The CIA recruits at colleges all over the country. That's why they call him Ivy and League. Yeah. And uh, it was Ransom that allowed the CIA to, to recruit at the University of Texas, of course, because he was OSS. So that's the Harold Bird. All the connections, all the major connections are there, not only to connect with individuals intimately related to the assassination, but Bird himself is intimately related because he owns the crime scene. You explained a lot there, but to kind of sum up the point will be to talk about the kind of interrelationships and connections with a lot of people that get involved, which is not just the Texas, but a lot of these people that had the same mindset. And a lot of it's about profit. A lot of it's about, you know, their influence into our government, which should not be a thing. Um, but overall, I think it's everything everyone can get on board with, which is the fact that a lot of these names that get brought up of specific individuals with a lot of money happen that money brings you a lot of power. And that kind of gets involved into the assassination. And when it comes into a lot of influence into our government, there were certain aeronautics programs, many high tech companies that were built um, with money from the these, what you would call private donors or just money from big oil people. Um, for me, it was just suspicious because when you look at, you can look at the connections with the assassination and the crime scene, but really it was about trying to understand the the individuals that get pointed out. Obviously, there's Alan Dulles and there's many others that get named, whether it was specific programs or whether it was specific plots that they had involved previous with the government with assassinating foreign prime leaders. But when we talk about names like Clint Murchison and we talk about names like H.L. Hunt, there needs to be a more established credibility than just Madeline Brown speaking about the Murchison party, which I don't necessarily believe. I think it's interesting. But there's a lot of names that I've started to realize with digging through testimonies and different statements where you kind of realize it's not so simple cut. I mean, the question always comes into when someone's trying to figure out who did it, they say something along the lines of who benefited. That's really hard to narrow down. 
because there was a lot of people that got something when Kennedy was killed. And that is the influence of the amount of how many of these private people and this kind of extremist mindset. I'm not going to say right wing because I don't believe it's necessarily the right wing that's established today that people would identify with. But there's a lot of people that were hardcore, everything about me and not caring about anyone else that were heavily influential into politics. And for me, it was trying to find that influence in there. And I think a lot of that gets brought out during Johnson's kind of whole presidency, which a lot of people can point at. And I, I don't necessarily think Johnson had involvement. I mean, maybe somewhat. I don't think any of the big oil people necessarily were 100 percent in there because we still have all topsy stuff that just – it's that's got to be on a way deeper level. I believe they have the power for sure. The president does. But I also believe that there's a lot of conflicting things now as well, too. Why did the Kennedy family keep so many things private and so many things secret? I get it's for this and for that. But there was a lot of things where Earl Warren is a good example. He was way too close to that case to serve on the commission. Whether Johnson knew it or not, I don't know. But he wouldn't let people see autopsy photographs that were on the Warren Commission where their whole job was to investigate because he felt like they were private and he wanted to keep, you know, whatever with the Kennedy family. But then there's Jackie Kennedy, the private interview he did where no one else on the commission was able to interview her. That's a problem. That's a really deep, whatever you want to call it, doing your job or doing your service or just being a good friend of the family. I don't know. I don't necessarily think he had involvement in it. But now you're part of the conspiracy because you've now limited the scope of the investigation. And the scope of that investigation was Lee Harvey Oswald did it. Here's the evidence that we want you to look at to see for yourself. And the evidence only went for Lee Harvey Oswald. So when we talk about like all these weird connections, they're very interesting. I appreciate them as someone that's interested in the case. But when we talk about the overall scope and we talk about verifying claims, you really can't debunk and say that those oil men theory is wrong or any of these theories are wrong. They might not be something you identify or agree with, but there is a large amount of shit going on in the 60s. And it's really important to bring all this up. So at least we have a factual record of what is connected to what, who is connected to who. So when people do dive into the subject, they can understand it for themselves. Well, it, <clears throat> the stuff going on in the sixties, just, they got away with this. You have to remember they got, they, they got away with it and success breeds, you know, repeat success. So they kept doing it. And you talk about all the stuff happening in the 60s. It's all happening right now. Uh, oil is still around. Big oil is still around. It's even bigger. Uh, CIA drug running. There's a black budget. There's a huge black budget. No idea what, how much money is there for that. No idea where it comes from. We've had luck in discovering the Iran-Contra scandal, which uh, they were running drugs. And we, have the, we have the Dark Alliance in L.A., uh, there's, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. They have a black budget and they fund it through drugs and arms sales and oil and all kinds of illegal stuff. That's what the CIA does to fund their operations. But it goes even further beyond that. Now you've got, you've got, you know, dozens of trillions of dollars that goes missing just at the Pentagon. And that's the black budget uh, today. And they got away with it then. And, you know, and that's why, you know, there's all that strange uh, investing going on, you know, the day or two before 9-11 happened. And then it'll happen for the next big disaster because these things are planned in advance and people make money off of them. And with the, with, you know, with, with, multi-trillions, dozens of multi-trillions of dollars completely hidden, you can do anything. You can fake a stock, you can fake a stock market crash, you can fake a stock market recovery, you can fake a recession, you can fake a depression, you can do anything you want with multi-trillions of dollars hidden. Despite your own personal belief or focus into who you think took the shots at Kennedy, do you are you open to a lot of the other alternative theories? Do you necessarily consider it having to be about solving the assassination? I'm kind of tired of hearing people talk about this is who did it. That's great. I don't you know, I don't care. I'm about 
looking at testimony and leaving a record for anyone else to hop into the subject and have the conversation about it because the conversation is being left out now. It's always got to be about who did it, not about why or whatever. It's really got to focus down now besides your own independent idea of who did it. Are you open to the other theories as much now that you've learned more about connections and kind of influence and a lot of things that go on? Mac Wallace's fingerprint being up on that six floor de depository building, um, Harold Byrd having that happen. I don't know if he even took a shot. It would match a couple statements from witnesses. It's all a man with circular glasses. But when you really boil it down to being open to research and other people's ideas as a community of people that believe conspiracy and JFK assassination, despite your belief, we're not working together on it. We're very, very independent and we're fighting over stupid little different th differences in the theories. So I want to get down to the point of having, being able to have a rational discussion with multiple different theories and really just excelling the assassination conversation as a whole forward, which I think you are in agreement with as much as I am. Yeah, this conspiracy is still in place. It's still there. It's still a conspiracy. Uh, every, everyone, still in the, everyone is aware of that. It's not about that. It's about talking about the JFK assassination still. The JFK assassination still exists. There are conspirators active living today, not old timers, active living today, new recruits. Anyone who lie, this is what my current writing is about. We go to Substack, we read, read that stuff. This is what I'm focused on. I'm, I'm not interested in theories, except to the extent that when you investigate any crime, you find the evidence. And when you have all the evidence, you base your theories on that. You never theorize before you have a complete, you know, data. So, but that's the way you solve crime. That's, that's the way you figure crimes out. And that's the way we figure this out. Um, and that's a legitimate use of theory. So I'm interested in criminology. Uh, and we talked about how that whole thing, conspiracy theorist has been twisted and conspiracy theory was invented as a derogative, an epithet, uh, an insult. And so I'm not interested in the popular vernacular conspiracy theory. I'm interested in criminology. There are conspiracy theories being investigated right now in police departments everywhere. And they every crime drama you watch on the screen, they it, the whole show is about their theories. They find the evidence, they find the people involved, they make the connection between them, and they develop a theory. And sometimes it doesn't pan out. Sometimes it does. Usually in the TV show, it does pan out by the end. We see these theories being done legitimately in criminology and fiction and in reality every day. I don't have to tell you that. So I'm not interested in theories. I'm interested in actual evidence, actual criminology, and that has taken us, people who hadn't get, haven't gotten trapped in the, you know, the driver shot JFK or the Secret Service guy behind him shot him. People who haven't gotten get trapped in what I call the tinfoil hat patrol, which is what those are. The tinfoil hat patrol comes up with those stupid theories and manages to convince most people that that's what happened. You know, the whole affairs with Marilyn Monroe. All of that tinfoil hat patrol. And people get trapped in it. And it's amazing how many people do. But that's human nature. So I'm interested in the criminology. Um, but that said, and I developed a lot of the detail. You know, I was the I was the first to write about DH Bird at all, let alone in that much detail. And everything else you read about DH Bird, well, I have to credit William Weston, who who taught me that he owned the building and gave me the basics of who he was. So but back in the, in the early 90s, it was just me and William Weston and everybody else that developed uh, that whole D.H. Bird stuff. And there's not much even after that. Uh, uh, we were the first. And so I got into the weeds. I got into the details. And my book is full. My early stuff is full. Two major monographs on the rifle and on the getaway car 
full of detail and names and connections. Uh, and I, you know, I had my fill of that because I saw that, you know, nobody, nobody's going to really, very few people are going to pay attention to that. Like Dulles said, nobody reads, but even the ones who do read, uh, they tend not to read that. So I started writing uh, about the bigger picture. And that took me to, you know, what's happening now? Conspiracy is still there. Anybody that lies about this conspiracy is a conspirator. Anyone who knowingly lies about it. No statute of limitation on murder. If you aid and abet a conspirator, you become a conspirator. So new generations have been taught to keep these files secret. Everybody who knows, everybody who met with every president, tr legally beginning with Trump, who had the power, according to the law, he was legally bound to release those files on October 26, 2017. Uh, and he didn't because and it later came out, I think it was earlier this year, some guy said that he was talking to Trump on the phone. And Trump said, uh, well, if you, if you had seen what they showed me in those files, you wouldn't have released them either. Trump said that. And so, and the fact that he didn't release them, he had the power. He, not only did he have the power to, he had the obligation to, by law, not releasing them. If you're the president and you don't release those files, you are a conspirator. You become a criminal even if it's just based on violating that law. But as we just learned with Trump, a uh, convicted felon, 31 counts, he was already a criminal when he took the oath of office, which, of course, negates his oath of office. Uh, he I just swore... want to clarify, I'm not a Trump person, but those 31 counts are all the same account, just different transactions. And anybody in politics is doing the exact same shit. It's a fucking pack of hyenas that are attacking another hyena, in my opinion. And that would be the same thing with the Biden laptop bullshit. It's all it's all dirty. They're all dirty. They all suck. I don't believe anybody is going to release records. You know, he's going to say he's going to do it this time. It's not going to happen. I just I want. Yeah, I think for I a lot about... of people. Hold on. For a lot of people now, they're commenting, they're leaving remarks about certain things, whether it's a political bias aside. But a lot of these people do not believe it's going to ever be released in their lifetime. And you're hearing a lot of people talk about that they want these files in their lifetime. I don't even think it's going to come out in mine. There's a lot of things that needs to be discussed, need to be cl clear here. And we haven't even come over the own conflict in the own communities about this. You've hit the conspiracy point home multiple times on multiple various episodes about defining it and all this type of stuff. But really, it's about just trying to give people just the basics. I mean, if anything, look at it for themselves and let them decipher. If they come out with a lone don't even insert your opinion. If they come out with a lone nut, then let them come out with a lone nut opinion. I've seen a lot of I've, there's a lot of things I'm a little bit more or less conspiracy on, but there's a lot of things I still believe that are very corrupt. And this is not how we were supposed to be. This is not what we were told. And I think a lot of that needs to come to light now. And I think now that you're seeing things like even the History Channel has done a th nine things the Warren Commission didn't know. And it was things about like Earl Warren lying and keeping testimony, Gerald Ford moving the back wound up six inches. This is not like, you know, independent researchers now speaking about it. This is now a lot of people in media are now hopping on board with it. But we need to get something out of that, and we haven't done that. So far, we're just kind of sitting here getting new articles that trend, and the next thing you know, it's gone again. So where's the documentation? Where's the next release? When are we going to get the next release? Yeah, I, I wrote about the 2016 election. That's on my substack. I wrote about the two, two articles on the 2020 election, um, and I wrote those before the actual election. Uh, and I haven't seen any cause to change any of what I said. Uh, and I just wrote my first one on the 2024 election. And I'll continue that when there's something new to say about it. So far, what I wrote about the 2024 election stands. It's what I wanted to say. It's short. It's about RFK Jr. And nothing has changed my opinion of what I said in that article. And so if you want to get up to speed on where I am about what's happening now, uh, and and I reveal in my, my my two articles on the 2020 election, I talk about Trump. I talk about how Trump won the 2016 election. 
the real story about why he won and uh, you know what happened in the 2020 election. And I came down to a soundbite. Um, you know, we're doing a podcast, so we might as well do sound bites. Uh, Trump was a Frankenstein monster created for a purpose. And like a Frankenstein monster, he has to be destroyed. And that's what they're doing. And I'm still confident that they will. Uh, just anyway, yeah, you know, a lot of rulings are still to come about Trump. Uh, at this point in our history, it's not all resolved yet. Uh, but and I'm not making I'm not making any predictions. All I've done in my articles of the last presidential elections, uh, this new weird phase of presidential elections since 2016, all I've done there is just say what I'm seeing happening now and what that tells me about what's happening. And that has played out. Uh, you know, I didn't intend on predicting anything. I don't want to predict anything. I certainly wouldn't be foolish enough to predict anything that's going to happen this year because Man, but I'll tell you this, it's epic. This is an epic year. Uh, and the things that are start, going to start happening rapidly are going to be, I think, amazing. Uh, we are going, it, I don't know if it'll get like 68, but man, at the end of 68, we were all exhausted. You know, uh, knock on wood, it won't be like 68. And that's when they started shooting everybody. Um, but it's going to be epic. Uh, just watch and learn. It's, that's that's where I came down on in my writing. Uh, I said, you know, this is stacking up to be an epic election year. Uh, what we should do is watch and learn because we're going to learn a lot. Whatever happens this year, we are going to learn a lot about how our government exists and how it works in its current form and i still call it an assassinocracy we haven't been in a democracy since kennedy was killed since kennedy was killed it's been an assass an assassinocracy robert kennedy senior senator robert kennedy was the first political candidate who tried to become president under the assassinocracy Robert Kennedy, Senator Robert Kennedy, was a conspiracy theorist. He knew, he saw all the files. They showed him all the files. He knew it was a conspiracy. He knew all about the conspiracy. He knew who did it. He was going to release those files. And he let that slip out in a private conversation with a bunch of aides uh, right before. And it's actually, I, I, got, I nailed the date, April 19th, 1968. It was on a meeting, private meeting after uh, a speech he gave up in the hotel room with a bunch of close aides. They asked him about it. He said, yeah, I'm going to release the files. That, you know, whether that got out or not, that got him killed. Uh, two months, within two months, he was dead. And you talk about why the, why the Kennedys are so secretive? That's why. Of course, it's my position, and I wrote about this in that latest article in the 2024 election. Bobby, Ke Bobby Kennedy's biggest mistake was keeping it a secret. Now, he, he, did, he said that privately, which is how we know that he, he knew it. And of course, it came out in the book Brothers by um, Damn, really, David name? Talbot? Come on now. Talbot. Tal Talbot, yeah. I had it right when you said You're that. fucking remembering oilmen's names and Nazis' names and people from Guadalajara and your... I'm not... I'm not... You have a lot of guys on your podcast that have amazing memories. I'm, I'm totally in awe of guys that come on these podcasts and they have everything memorized. And, you know, people like uh, Cyril Weck could do that. John Judge could do it all day. And he said he couldn't hold a candle to Mae Russell. She could do it all day. I have an average memory. I've always had an average memory. I don't make any pretenses about it. I have to have my notes. <laughs> so, 
when I when I do dates and names like this, I'm looking at notes. And that's the only way I can do it. And that's a, the only way anybody with a normal average memory can do it. Well, on a wrapping thing, on a wrapping thing here, um, where can people find your Substack, Rich? I appreciate always appreciate our chats. I um, appreciate this one as well, too. Um, but is there a place where people can find your Substack? Any other links you'd like to promote your Twitter, um, Center for Deep Political Research as well, too? Um, yeah, well, we're we're trying to get Center for Deep Political Research back up. It's not up. Uh, our web page is still dormant, uh, and we're we're trying to get things going. Uh, we still have plans, but we're doing it as a loose group of friends, uh, which we you know we were incorporated as CDPR, but we're not now. We're not currently. And I told the guys when I when I came up with this idea, and Jeff Worcester ran with it. He said, "We have to have this one strict rule: funding first. We got to get the funding together and secure it, because people will try to mess with your funding." Once again, money and power. And so we haven't been able to do that yet. And it's a, it's tough. And it, like I said to him, it may very well be impossible, but we're still trying. We're still looking at it. But we have some major projects that we are, are in the works with uh, that we're doing on our own and trying to finance on our own. So forget about CDPR for now. Um, I'm not even going to give you a timeline, but I, I'm excited about what's happening. Just Google me, Richard Bartholomew, JFK. If you just do Richard Bartholomew, you're going to find the famous ones, ones that are more famous than me. Richard Bartholomew, JFK. And, you know, I'm on page one. All of my Substack stuff is, is on page one and cartooning stuff. Uh, if you want to add cartooning to it, you'll find my cartoons. Or you can just go to Bartholomew's, which is my brand name, bartholomew's.substack.com. And I'm on Facebook and Instagram and X Twitter. I call it X Twitter and uh, all that stuff. I'm even on Reddit, but I don't do much there. But anyway, so just Google me and you'll find me. I'll link all previous links and all other links I can find for you in the description below. I um, appreciate you again, Rich. And thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank. Stay tuned for our next episode.